And then the second two words that he said, the second and third word he said is will build. Now I'll have you know it wasn't until I studied Spanish <laughs> that I actually kind of got a grip on English grammar, okay? <laughs> but when you say I will, you are speaking in the future tense, all right? In other words, when Jesus said I will build it, he was saying that he was, well, we would say it like this in Texan, he's fixing to build it, all right? He's getting ready to do it. He's going to do it. He said, I will. And when you use the word will, what you're doing is you're activating that part of you that intends to do something, right? And there's a verse that I love, and it says this, Psalms 127 and verse 1. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. God's the one that has to build the church. Jesus is the one that builds his church. There's a lot of people that have tried a lot of ways uh, to build the church, but I'm here today to tell you that, that it, unless the Lord builds the house, speaking of the church, that's why sometimes I say, is there anybody in this house? I'm referring to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And there was a church in the book of Acts called the church at Philippi, and the scripture tells us exactly how Jesus built that church. And I want to take a quick look at that today. How did he build the church in Philippi? He did it with a businesswoman by the name of Lydia, a demon-possessed slave girl, and number three, a pagan city employee who worked in the local jail, all right? And so let's, let's look at this for just a moment. Paul and Silas had been in the city of Philippi for a few days, and so it was the Sabbath day, and so their custom was to find a place to go and worship and pray. And so they went down to the riverside where, where people spent time praying, and while they were there, they met a group of women, and they spoke to these women undoubtedly about Jesus, a group of ladies there. And, and, and there was one of these women who was a business lady, a seller of purple, and uh, you know, her name was Lydia, and she was a worshiper of God, but she didn't know Christ yet, and she heard them speak. And I want you to notice what the Word says that ha happened here in Acts 16 and 14, all right? It says that the Lord opened her heart. Who did that? Who, who opened her heart? Did Paul open her heart? Did Silas open his, her heart? Did his great persuasion, his great oratory, his great preaching, his great teaching, did that open her heart? Uh -uh. How many of you know the word is very plain? It says the Lord opened her heart. Let me tell you something. There's some things that you and I can do. We can proclaim the gospel. Come on. We can tell our neighbors about Christ. We can tell the people what he's done for us. But I'm going to tell you something. It's the Lord's job to open up some somebody's heart. Come on. That, that's because he's the one that builds his church. Amen. And I love this because it says, and, and when she, after she uh, took heed to the things spoken by Paul, she and her household were baptized. How many of you know that the Lord was building his church? Amen. And, and, and so you and I are co-laborers, right? We're co-laborers. We're co-builders with Christ. But let me tell you something. The master builder is Jesus. He's the foundation. He's the cornerstone. Jesus is what we build on. But let me tell you something. Jesus is the one who puts the living stones in their place. Jesus is the one who builds his church. Amen. And so you continue on uh, reading this chapter, and you'll discover that there was this slave girl who made, must have made a lot of money for her masters because she had a demon within her and she could foresee the future and she would tell the future in a demonic kind of a way. And she began to walk behind Paul and Silas saying the saying, uh, she, said, she said, these are the servants of the Most High God and they're going to show us the way of salvation. And uh, while that was the truth, it was annoying to have a demonically possessed woman following them around, saying this, really taking the uh, eyes off of Jesus, the one that they were proclaiming. He, 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 Paul and Silas, they weren't worried about themselves getting any credit. They were worried about Jesus getting the credit. Amen? And so finally Paul said in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 18, after many days and getting annoyed, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And how many of you know it came out in the name of Jesus? Amen? 
Amen? That spirit of divination left her. And uh, we don't know exactly what happened here, but I like to believe that, that since she was no good to her masters anymore, she became a part of the church there at Philippi. I, I can't prove that, but I'd like to believe that. But anyhow, you know the rest of the story. Their masters got really upset, and they went to the authorities, and, and uh, they wound up, Paul and Silas wound up getting beat and thrown into jail. Uh, you know, and it, how many of you realize that sometimes when you're, when you're, when you're trusting God to build his church it doesn't really look like it's going to happen sometimes had Paul and Silas given in to fear and doubt and wonder you know who knows what would have happened to the church at Philippi but you see they knew one thing they knew the promise of Jesus amen Jesus said I will build it I will build it and I kind of think that somewhere down in that jail cell after being beat I think they began to praise God and said I know you're going to build a church right here in Philippi they began to worship they began to praise they began to call out on the name of the Lord amen all of that jail heard them and the scripture says that God sent a mighty earthquake to the degree that all of the doors opened up and, and the jailer looked in there and he thought, oh no, everyone's going to escape. And he knew that death awaited him if they escaped. And so he said, I'm going to just kill myself. And they said, they said, no, don't harm yourself. Don't hurt yourself at all. And, and so the man, having heard their praise and worship and having probably listened to them talk about Jesus, he said, what do I have to do to be saved, right? How many of you know it was the Lord that brought all that on? And Paul says to them, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be safe. Not just you, but you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house. And they took care of all of his, uh, their wounds and washed them all up. And the scripture says, immediately he and his family were baptized. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it works. The Lord was building his house. And I'll have you know that that's the way that Jesus is still building his house. He still builds his house by engineering all of everything that happens in people's lives to bring them to Jesus. I'm just here today to tell you that there are people we don't even know yet, people that we haven't even met yet, that are going to come through the doors of this church and give their lives to Jesus Christ. And you see, God by the Holy Spirit is already out there doing the work, preparing the soil, getting them ready. You see, it's not my church, it's His church. Hello? He's getting ready to do the work, open up their heart, cause them to believe, and not just them, but their household is going to be saved. Come on, somebody to give the Lord a hand of praise if you believe it today. <laughs> Yesterday in Austin, I stood amazed as they introduced about 50 of the, the, the area representatives of Celebrate Recovery all the way from Louisiana, Kansas, Oklahoma, all across Texas, New Mexico, all different places. And uh, if you know a little bit about Celebrate Recovery nomenclature, you always introduce yourself like this. You say, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ and have struggled with, and then they name whatever it is. And it was fascinating to sit there and watch all of these people who used to be outlaw bikers, all right, who used to be involved in drugs and alcoholism and prostitutions and sexual addictions. But what I was saying is, it's incredible to see that God is still building His church in the same way. How does He build His church? By saving lives, by bringing people to salvation. And I believe that God wants to use us as co-laborers in that. If you believe it, say amen. And then He said this, He said, I will build... Pastor Bob's church. No. Nah. I will build my church. It's his church. I, all I am is just a simple under shepherd to the great shepherd of the sheep. All right. That, that's all I am. All right. And I know sometimes people say to me this question, you know, if you, people I know and haven't talked to, how's your church doing? Actually, it's really nice that they say that. They mean very well. They're inquiring. They care. They love me. They love the church. They love you people. They pray for you. So they ask that question. But And I, and I, I would never tell them, it's not my church. It's his. No, that would be like super arrogant, right? But let me tell you something. There is a truth that it is not my church. This is his church. Come on. It's his church. Why is it his church? Because he purchased it with his own blood. 
Let me give you the scripture, Acts 20, 28. It says, therefore, take heed to yourselves. Paul's talking to all the shepherds, and he says, and to, the, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, when I purchase something, generally it's with money, all right? But when Jesus redeemed the church, he used something that's much more precious than money or silver and gold, right? We are, have been bought with the shed blood of Jesus. We are precious to him, amen. And you know there's not a single person that's going to be able to brag about how they got into heaven, uh, you know, by their own means. You can't buy your way in. You can't purchase your way in. Uh, there's only one way into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's through Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, amen. Now, if I buy something and I loan it to Jose, I always want to pick on Jose, right? He's growing into a pastor. You got to be tough. If I loan it to Jose, I know one thing. He's going to take good care of it. Why? Because he knows I put, bought money for it. He's going to take care of it. If he needed my car or whatever, I'd give it to him, let him borrow it for a couple of days. He's going to take good care of it just like it's his, right? And that's what we need to do with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And that's why we can't abuse people in the church. We've got to treat everybody with grace, everybody with love, amen, everybody with an encouragement. Am I right? You want to know why? Because the people of the church, they don't belong to us. They belong to Jesus. They're His possession. And just like if you borrowed your neighbor's possession, you better take care of it as we treat one another and love one another. Come on, we got to take care of that because everybody that's in the church belongs to Jesus, amen. In fact, you don't even belong to yourself. What? You don't even belong to yourself. Let me read the scripture. 1 Corinthians 6. It says this. It says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. <laughs> Wow, what was the price? The price was the shed blood of Jesus. You don't belong to yourself even. We belong to Jesus, amen? Is there anybody here who believes you belong to Jesus? Amen, and let me tell you something. That's a good thing. You want to know why? Because he's going to take good care of you, right? He knows how to take care of his stuff. He knows how to take care of those that have, that have come to Him in faith. And so that's why it says, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, God had a plan from the very beginning. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and not only us, but millions of others scattered throughout the world. Amen? Are you glad to be a part of His church? Come on. I'm glad to be in His church. And then he said, I will build my what? The licks word is the word church. That's not a word that you hear out in society very much, except for what it means, the church. The biblical word for church is the word ecclesia, which means called out ones. We've been called out of the world to become a part of something that's much greater, right? It's not to be a part of a country club or an organization or a denomination, but we, we are part of the eternal assembly, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And, and the scripture actually uses the word church in two different means of expressing that. First of all, we see the word church used as in regard to a local church, right? Uh, there's the church at Corinth in the Bible and the church of Ephesus and the church of Laodicea. And I'm glad that Fountain of Life is an expression of the local church, right? We are a local church. The 2300 Barker Oaks, the church meets here. Come on. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also the sense that the, in the Word of God that the church is more than just something local. It's also something that's incredibly universal. I'm talking about what the writer to the Hebrews spoke of when he said in Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn registered in heaven. Registered in heaven. Wow. That's a big question. Is your name registered in heaven? 
Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You know, someone said, well, you know, they got to heaven. I said, well, Lord, you know, I was a member of a church. My name was on the roster. I, I was a part of it. Let me tell you something. That doesn't necessarily get you in. You've got to be born again. Come on. Your name has to be written in heaven. 